Hi guys, Jordan with Motion Array, and today we're gonna to be taking a look at how to use stock video more effectively. So let's get into it. There used to be this mindset among creators that you weren't allowed to use stock footage. It was cheating somehow. But over the last five years, there's been a bit of a shift of mindset among content creators. People are realizing that there's a lot of creative and potentially powerful ways that you can actually use stock footage in your creative productions. But that doesn't mean there's things you shouldn't watch out for when using stock video. Let's just get one thing out of the way. We sell stock footage here at motionarray.com. Is everybody okay with that? We good? Bias stated up front. Cool, so with that out of the way, we're gonna go over three tips to help you use stock footage more effectively. Because if you're using stock footage in your production, you wanna use it to its maximum potential. So let's get it started off with number one, matching color, quality, and frame rate. Here's a frustrating problem. You grab a piece of stock video, plop it down on your timeline, and then realize it doesn't really look the same as any of your other footage. So how do you make it work with the rest of your shots? There's a lot of different ways you can go about making your footage match, and it seems like there's a million different things you can tweak and play around with in order to actually achieve this synchronicity in your project. But what we're gonna do is blaze through a couple areas that you should definitely hit in this process. Color. You can easily make adjustments to the look of your footage with the Lumetri color panel. One of the easiest ways to go about this is to use the matching feature from the April update of Premiere Pro. To start with, go to your Lumetri color section and go down to color wheels and match and make sure the comparison view is clicked and this box should pop up. Here you can see the difference between your reference clip and the clip that you actually want to change the color of. To select your reference clip, either drag the slider left or right here, drag the time code left or right here, or key in a specific time code that the reference clip is playing at. Now on your timeline, make sure that the playhead is over top of the clip that you actually want to change the color of and make sure that clip is highlighted. Now we have the clips that we want to match side by side. If you have a person's face prominently displayed in the shot and you want to try to match skin tones as well, make sure that face detection is checked. Otherwise, uncheck it. Now when you hit apply match, it'll try to match the color between these two clips as closely as possible. Your mileage might vary, but this can be a really easy shortcut to get you close to start with. Then play around with your white balance, tint, and saturation to dial in the color. But don't stop here. If you have a clip like this one and the greens are incredibly deep, and you want to match it to a clip that you're having trouble matching the greens to, there's one last solution for you to try. Go down to your HLS secondary section. You can use the HLS secondary section in order to isolate specific colors. Once you do, then you can widen this range and then change the hue of that specific color only, helping you to achieve an amazingly specific match. We actually did a video that delves a little bit deeper into the HSL secondary selector. And it's this one here. Check it out if you want to learn how to use this tool a little bit more in depth. Next, we need to worry about luminance. How bright is your clip compared to everything else? Use the exposure slider to bring everything up or down. Then use the whites, highlights, shadows, and blacks to tweak each different area of your footage. You want to watch out for your black areas in specific. Does your footage have a bit more of this muddy feel? almost like it's raw footage? Or does it have really deep, rich blacks? This is a really easy way to make your footage look out of place if you don't match these up. Next, let's talk about resolution. If you downloaded a 4K clip to use in your timeline, but your composition is set up to be 1080, you'll probably end up with something like this. With your new clip zoomed in way too much. It's always better to downscale 4K to 1080 rather than upscale 1080 to 4K. So what's the solution? Zoom the bigger clip back out. You can do this by going under Effects Controls and then scale it down, or right-click it on the timeline and hit Set to Frame Size. But don't hit Scale to Frame Size. It's a little bit confusing, but please don't. And now onto frame rate. Using footage of different frame rates can be tricky because, well, there's actually a lot of different reasons why but mainly because different frame rates can be great for different situations. So how do you deal with mismatched frame rates? Well, for a quick and dirty solution, my suggestion would be to set your composition to 24 frames per second, or the lowest overall frame rate that you have on your timeline. If you're not sure what your footage frame rates are, your project manager will be able to show these to you. Then if you bring in any footage that's set to a higher frame rate, like 30, 48, 50, or even 60 frames per second, you can simply add a posterized time effect so that it looks like it's actually playing back at 24 frames per second. The results can be surprisingly effective. 
but every so often you might find yourself in a situation where the stock footage looks better than the footage you captured yourself. Whoops. Well, depending on your situation, lessening the quality of your stock footage might not actually be too hard. If you notice a lot of noise in the shot, add some noise. There's actually an effect for that. If you notice that the highlights of your clip are blown out, blow out your stock footage a little bit more. The point is, is that it's actually probably better to grossen up your stock footage if it makes it more consistent with the rest of your project. It's actually a better solution than having one randomly amazing piece of footage sticking out like a sore thumb. Number two, don't be afraid to play around with it. Not all stock footage should just be taken as is and plopped into your video project. Some pieces of stock footage actually require additions in order to be made complete, like screen replacement clips, for example. These are intended for you to actually do a lot of work with before it will fit in with your finished video. By the way, if you wanted to learn how to do a screen replacement for your videos, we have a tutorial on that, and it's this one right here. The link is in the description below. But with other pieces of footage, it can be challenging to see just what you'd change in order to actually make it better. Take this clip, for example. It's a cool shot, but if my video is moving at a fast pace, there's too much time in the middle between the focus of the fence and of the machine. So why not add a speed ramp in the middle to make the footage more energetic? It's a simple change, but it can make it feel a lot better. By the way, we also have a video all about speed ramping if you want to delve into that topic in specific. But when you realize that you're not bound to use the piece of stock footage as it is, a whole world of possibilities opens up to you. This is a great aerial shot, but you don't have to play it forwards. How would it look backwards? And would it suit your project better? But some people have taken it as far as to composite entirely new elements that actually weren't there in those shots to begin with. The more you see stock footage as a piece of a puzzle rather than a finished product on its own, the more creativity and flexibility you'll be able to have to enhance your larger project as a whole. And number three, choose believable footage. Let's end at the beginning. Even if you match everything like color, resolution, frame rate, and even composite a bunch of random stuff in there that wasn't there to begin with, there's still a chance I might not actually believe your footage. And when I say believe, I don't mean believe as in like I believe that place exists, or I believe those people are actually real. What I mean is, does that shot make me go, oh yeah, I'm watching a video? Does it take me out of the moment and make me realize that somebody went on to a different site and grabbed some stock footage to use in their project? And this really all comes down to one question. What are you trying to achieve with the stock footage that you're using? Because the answer can be different from project to project. Sometimes it's acting as an establishing shot for an area you don't have access to. Sometimes it's an emotional shot that drives your story forward. And sometimes it's literally just filler because you don't have any more shots to put over your piece of narration. For example, what I mean by believe is, do I believe that you actually shot this piece of footage with the intention of using it in this particular project? If you were just watching as somebody who's casually observing your finished video, would you be taken out of the moment seeing that piece of stock video? Some projects you work on don't require you to worry about this too much. Like if you just need a shot of people smiling and laughing together as a part of a montage to show how your product makes people happier. But there's times when you're working on something a little more narrative and your stock footage has to work within a larger story. One thing that can really help is by making sure that there's nothing in your shots that stands out and shows that it doesn't belong with your other clips. And a really helpful way to make sure that's the case is by choosing clips with a degree of ambiguity. Let's take some driving shots, for example. This one is a snowy shot of a single car driving down the road. It's a nice shot, but it's also ambiguous enough to be Whistler Canada, Colorado USA, or even somewhere in Austria, for all we know. There's nothing to give it away as being only one place in specific. And this is a big reason why aerial stock footage has been used in a lot of projects. It's because unless you've been to this specific hillside, you probably wouldn't be able to tell that it's not in the same area as this next shot. You believe that they belong together. Or if I wanted to take a video of my wife and make it look like in the next scene, she's running through a field of wheat. I mean, you can do that because there's really nothing about this person that tells me it's not this person. Well, I mean, other than me just telling you right now. But it's not just about ambiguity, because there's projects where you need to be incredibly specific. If you're working on a video and you mention the President of the United States, it's pretty hard to ambiguously show the White House. It's all about knowing your project and what you need, and making sure before you actually select a piece of stock footage, critically thinking about whether or not it will mesh with the rest of your video. And guys, that's it. That's been three tips to using stock footage a little bit more effectively. 
But here at Motionary, we always like to finish it off with a bonus tip. One of the least effective parts of stock footage is trying to find the right piece of stock footage. It can be incredibly frustrating. And I used to work for a previous organization, and I was tasked with finding a particular piece of stock footage. It was incredibly difficult, and I remember searching for hours and hours trying to find the right one. I remember at one point being so frustrated that I pulled up a text document, and anytime I found a piece of footage that I even liked just a little bit, I'd copy the URL and paste it into the document just in case I came across a project that I could use it in later. At least I wouldn't have to wade through everything again. Well, here at Motionary, we actually have a feature that's built right into the platform so that you can save videos and other pieces of stock elements to go back to later in a flash. It's called Collections. Anytime you come across something that you like, you can click this button down here and it will allow you to save it into a folder that you get to name yourself. And once you get a lot of folders racked up, you can quickly select folders so that you can store things in specific categories. Categories for a specific project, or maybe even for a certain kind of footage. The choice is yours, but in the end, if you ever want to go back to that piece of footage, it's right there waiting in your collections. But guys, that's it for me. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, as always, we've got tons of other tutorials here at MotionArray.com. Thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video.